lover of join in on fun discussions about golf from the perspective of two plugged in Minnesota golf geeks, Brad Cole and David Branstad. This is 10,000 Swings. Hello and welcome back to 10,000 Swings. It is Sunday, April 25th, 2021. I'm Brad Cole. I'm David Branstad. 10,000 Swings is brought to you by Jarrett Yalen with Northwestern Mutual. Jarrett is a good friend of ours, and let's just say that we trust him enough to give him four footers. For whatever financial questions you have, call Jarrett with Northwestern Mutual, 612-209-4523, or visit his website at www.jarrettyalen.com. He can do retirement planning, life insurance, you name it. Give Jarrett a call today. We've got a great show for you that might include the Zurich Classic, the new bonus structure on the PGA Tour, and some NFL draft chatter. And next week, we'll actually have Ty Munichy from PXG to discuss club fitting on the show. But first, this week, we have Blake Barrett of IFA. Welcome to the show, Blake. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Blake, tell us a bit about uh, what mm. IFA is, what you do, how you got started. Uh, obviously, NFL Draft Week, a lot of people are buzzing about that, and a lot of your world kind of revolves around that. So if you give us a little uh, background mm. on both what you do and what your company does, that'd be awesome. Yeah, quick quick background on me. I'm originally from Hopkins, Minnesota here. I uh, went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and uh, right out of college, got into the sports representation business. I was at a couple different firms. Um, I worked predominantly uh, in Los Angeles at a firm called Impact Sports, and I was just kind of a young sponge picking up the business and spending a, a million hours learning the CBA and the salary cap structure and the nuances of the business. And that's really where I got my feet wet. I was just worked a million hours and, and made no money and uh, tried to figure out <laughs> uh, how to make it in this business. I, and I just, you know, I felt that there was a, a much better way. Uh, to represent professional athletes than at least what I had had witnessed and what I had heard and what I had read. So I decided to take the leap of faith in 2009 to start IFA. And uh, we started with no clients and um, really just set out to represent, you know, good guys that are mature, that get it, that work hard, uh, that understand humility and, and philanthropy and, and, um, and are trying to do the right thing. Uh, we felt that we could find good players, uh, but if we could find the high character guys that care about those things, uh, then we felt it could snowball. Um, so that's what we do. We're kind of a full service representation firm. Uh, we, we represent the players on their behalf to, to negotiate their NFL contracts. Uh, but, you know, frankly, that takes 72 hours or 96 hours, but it's all the stuff that we're doing in between that really occupies all the time, which is probably far too much. So Blake, I gotta be honest with you here. I mean, you know me, like we are a huge Minnesota University of Minnesota Gophers football supporters, season tickets. My son is a fanatic. So in probably this order, my son's favorite football players, Anton Winfield Jr., who he's got to pick with um, on the field after the Penn State win, Blake Cashman. We actually took a tour of... Uh, of the stadium and he got a picture taken in front of his locker um imitating the targeting call in his last game <laughs> as a senior mm -hmm. which which blake was kind enough to to sign for him mm -hmm. and send to him and then tyler johnson and rashad bateman you guys you have all of them right i don't have winfield okay uh, you don't have, have winfield but i have the other guys i've actually never even met winfield uh but i do have the other guys and ironically, Blake Cashman just announced he's going to be doing a football camp at Eden Prairie with uh, with Carter Coughlin and and Ryan Conley this summer. So you should bring your son over there. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna cheat ourselves the system. We're getting him in there. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> he's he is so pumped to go. <laughs> that's great. Awesome. No, that's a lot of good stuff. And uh, you know. One of the reasons why we wanted to have you on the show, obviously talk a bit about the draft and everything happening in the football world, but you're also a big golfer, right? Like you play quite a bit. I try to as much as, as much as humanly possible. I was one, and, of, the, one, of, one of the few, uh, there were a few benefits of the last year being, being that golf was one of the only things you could do it was it, it very much was in line with what I wanted to do anyway. <laughs> and you're a member at Oak Ridge, correct? In Hopkins? I am. 
How long have you been there? Everything I know is from David Branstead. (laughs) We won't hold that against you. Uh, So how long have you been a member at Oak Ridge? I've been there. So when I moved back, when my wife and I moved back from California in 20, uh, was it 2009 or 2010, we joined within a year of that. But I kind of grew up there. My parents were there. So I was there as a, I remember my parents would drop me off at eight in the morning and pick me up at six at night. And I would just run back and forth in the tennis courts to the pool. And at the time I didn't golf because it looked too boring to me. And now I'm, you know, every night I cry myself to sleep that I didn't take advantage of the beautiful golf course that was next door. So now I got the messed up swing that Branson tries to correct and, you know, try to get out there and, and enjoy it when I can. Hey, how do you, how do you like the new course? I'm dying Looks to go gorgeous. see it. Is it awesome? They did a really good job. Yeah. Uh, oh, they, did, they did a good job. Yeah. You got to get over there. Um, it's good. I mean, it's, it's different, but they did a really good job. You know, I had my doubts whether they could pull it off, but they pulled it off. <laughs> yeah, I love, I, from, I love from everything it. I've heard, it, it's, it's been amazing, but yeah, it's definitely different than what it was. That's for It's sure. different. The club's changing a lot. Different membership, a little different leadership, uh, new course. Um, so it's a little bit of a changing of the guard, which is probably a good thing. Yeah, not all bad. No. So Blake, you have do you have any athletes that are non NFL or are they all NFL players? All NFL. Yeah. All NFL. And of so and what's your handicap? I think a seven right now. Seven? Okay. So of your athletes, can any of them beat you at golf? Oh yeah. Well, Thielen for sure. He took like six hundred bucks from me a couple weeks ago. <laughs> um I'm guessing he's probably the only client that can take me down. And I, frankly, I choked that one away. (laughs) I think he's the only one. Him and Chad Beebe took took a buddy of mine down, and it had nothing to do with Chad Beebe, I'll tell you that much. (laughs) (laughs) So, in your opinion, based on who you know, players involved with the NFL, either current players, uh, announcers, etc., is it kind of the consensus that Tony Romo is the best golfer involved with the NFL, or who, who in your mind would be the the best player? I mean, Romo's definitely at the top of the heap, but like, oh, well, I guess what you said is involved in the NFL. I mean, I I go out to the Tahoe tournament, or I have a few times, and they got there's some good players. Like, Larry Fitz is a really good player. Aaron Rodgers is a really good player. Patrick Peterson's a really good player. I don't think Sam Bradford plays in it, but Sam's a really good golfer. Um, Blair Walsh was a good golfer. I'm trying to think of the guys that I've played with or been in their group or played with here. There's a decent so, amount of them. Even John so Randall's a good golfer. Yeah. John Randall. Randall's a really good golfer. So yeah, here's my question. A, he'll say he's a 15. He's a sandbagger, but he's probably <laughs> an 8 or 9. So b- by position... Who's the best golfer? It has to be kickers, right? Not even close. No? It's for sure kickers. Kickers oh, one, quarterbacks two? Yeah, I'd say quarterbacks yeah. are kickers. Case Keenum's a really good golfer, too. I'd I've uh, quarterbacks are kickers. I actually, when I was in Chicago, I got to play a bit with Robbie Gold. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when I moved back here, I got to play a bit with Ryan Longwell. And both those guys, Longwell was a very good player. He actually tried to qualify for some stuff and... Um, those guys are both pretty solid, but it is interesting to see the guys that can, you know, do multiple things at that level. I played a lot of high school golf against Adam, uh, Thielen. He was a bit mm-hmm. younger than me, but he was a stud. He's the Detroit lakes team always had kids coming up that are sixth and seventh grade that could break 80. So yeah, one uh, of the, one of the, one of the young members at Oak Ridge, Mox Gunderson, I think played on his team too. He was telling me some stories. Mox is a good golfer also. Nice. Yeah. Mox is. Um, Adam, when, when Adam's done playing football, I could see him trying to make a run at one of the tours. He loves it, takes it very seriously. Like when he can actually focus on it again, like it wouldn't shock me. I could see that for sure. No, I, I kind of thought Longwell was going to get, make a little bit more of a push, you know, and who knows, he could still, you know, for the champions tour and there's been a decent, or I shouldn't say a decent amount, but there's been a few guys that have actually gone, you know, at the end of their career, try to go out and play some different mm-hmm. stuff. I know um, what Johnny Bench, a couple other ones that have, you know, tried to transition later on and, and play some stuff. So yep. <clears throat> it is kind of fun that you could have potentially have like two different pro careers, you know, right. at, that, at that level. So yeah. 
kind of fun to think about. Yeah, um, it's not sure that's fun. It actually kind of pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to make a pro in anything, and these guys are going to do it yeah. twice. <laughs> like I could totally right. see Larry Fitz try to make a, a run as well. For sure. Absolutely. Um, so it's draft week. I mean, what does it look like? You know, is it pretty quiet for you right now? Does it get crazy right after the draft? Or what's it kind of look like in your world right now? It's crazy up until, like, actually right about now. Like, now there's a couple final calls and meetings, but, like, most of the stuff is pretty much done now. So it's just tying up loose ends, like, logistically. But now it's just a waiting game. Draft's coming up Thursday, Friday, Saturday of this week. And as I mentioned to you off air, I'm ready. I'm I'm always ready for it just to be over with because it's it's <laughs> regardless of where you get drafted outside of like maybe one or two overall, the weekend end, ends up being really long and there's a lot of emotions and it's everyone's anxious and you don't know where your home's going to be and you know every pick is ten minutes, fifteen minutes. I mean you can be there for hours and hours and hours and and. Uh, it's easier for me to put it all in perspective, but it's tough for the guys and their families that are going through it because they're with people that are just staring at them for hours on hours at a time waiting for it to happen. So it's like, it's just, it's mentally exhausting. At the end of the day, like a week from now, they're going to be in like rookie mini camp and back in OTAs and it's, they're going to start their career and no one's going to care if you were 48th or 67th or 78th. Anyway, you're going to have to go earn it because the coaches are going to play the players that can play. So I'm ready but, for it to be over with. But but hugs are back this year. Hugs are back at the draft. Hugs are back. Yeah, hugs are back at the draft for the few people that are actually going to Cleveland. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. speaking of Cleveland, how accurate or inaccurate is the movie Draft Day when it comes to all the behind the scenes kind of stuff? Like, is that movie that outlandish or is it actually kind of spot on? I never saw it. I didn't see it. It's it's uh, entertaining. It's a little bit ridiculous. There's a lot of movement. Uh, it's Kevin Costner at his finest, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll check. I'll check it out. I guess you, you lost me at Kevin Costner. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll check um, it out. And get back to you on that one. <laughs> so for you, do you have uh, multiple guys that are hoping to go first round, second round? What, what do you have cooking this well, week? We, we have we have four guys in the draft. Um, Rashad will go one, two is my best guess. I don't know, 15 to 40, 20 to 40, somewhere in that range. We have a D tackle uh, from Ohio State, Tommy Togiai, that I think will go as high as the second, probably as lowest as the fourth. I think he's kind of in that third, fourth round range based on all the information I have from all the teams. And then we have a receiver, Osiris Mitchell from Ohio State, who I think will be a day three guy, who's a long rangey athletic receiver that I think. I'll be surprised if he doesn't make a team wherever he ends up getting drafted. And then we have a kid named Raymond Bowman who actually went to Breck and Northwestern. Uh, that'll either be a day three guy or priority free agent, but also a good receiver. Very cool. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so I have to ask from Hopkins. I know you moved away a bit. Are you, are you still a big Vikings fan? Yeah. You know, I, I grew up a big Vikings fan. It's hard to be a, it's hard to be a fan once you're in the business. It's like you, you know, you know all the sausages made at that point. You know, I, um, it just, it's my fanship got taken away a long time ago. But I, I still, if I had my preference, I still want the Gophers to do well and I want the Vikings to do well. And obviously, we have, I don't know, six or eight Vikings clients and I'm very close with a lot of people in the organization. So I want them to do well. Uh, and it's always more fun here when the Vikings are good. But, you know, there's so much turnover with players and personnel and coaches and front office. And um, so I have different varying degrees of respect for different organizations, depending on how I feel they do business and what I see that makes sense. And, you know, which ones I, you know, have a personal relationship with. But if everything was equal, I'd want the Vikings to do well. You know, it makes my personal and professional life easier if I can stay here as often as possible. And the team is good and the Gophers have good players, then... You know, no offense to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or Columbus, Ohio, but you know, I'm fine if I don't have to go back there again. <laughs> right. It'd be it'd be very easy if the Gophers were just like number one in the nation, and you can just feed them into a a, a championship NFL team. And yeah, make things a lot easier for me. I'm rooting for that. Well, we we're in favor of that. I think at this point, 
with what's happened this off season, I think that the diehard Vikings fans will have a pretty hard time this week if they don't go with a offensive lineman uh, in the first round. But you never know. I never you never know who who drops or what you know what trades happen. I mean, crazy stuff happens. So you never, never uh, know. That's it, that's one thing you know about the draft is you never know about the draft. Yeah, it's it's entertaining, and that's what we're uh, that's what we're here for, right? To be entertained. For sure. For sure. So, speaking of being entertained, uh, Zurich this week. Wow, Blake, did you get a chance to watch? Got to be honest, I didn't watch one one swing of the club on television. I actually don't even watch a lot of golf. I love playing the game, but I don't watch it at all. Like I'll watch Sunday of the Masters. I'll watch a little of golf, but like you know, you might as well be speaking Chinese to me. I don't even know who's, who's involved. <laughs> well, there, there are definitely Probably names that you know that were involved this week. It was, it was a pretty entertaining event. So the Zurich Classic is now at the TPC Louisiana, and it's a really cool two-man team event. So on Thursday and Saturday, you play a two-man best ball, and then on mm-hmm. Friday and Sunday, it's alternate shot, and none of this, like, you know, Chapman or any of those other formats, it's, like, straight-up alternate shot. So once you start, there's no... You know, it, it's just, it's it's going, and it, it definitely went off the rails a bit. It was highly entertaining. The, uh, That's great. the other, That's a fun format. Yeah, and the other thing the tour did is they actually, all the players now have a, a team walk-up song. So when they walk to the first tee, they pick a song. And uh, Brandy and I were talking about this last week. I said that my song would be uh, Enter Sandman, and I'd probably pick either my dad or Tiger to be my partner. And Brandy said that he was going to go with Jukebox Hero, and he didn't care who his partner was. I don't care. I don't care. I just want Jukebox Hero as my, as my song. So, Blake, if you're playing this event, who's your partner? Anyone you want. Alive, dead, good golfer, bad golfer, anyone you want. And then you get to pick up a song for you and that person to walk up to. What are you going with? Well, I'd probably go with Fred Rapport as my partner because he's a – He's a dangerous 13. He's the biggest sandbagger I know. Um, I'd probably play with him against, could be Tiger Woods and Jack Nicholas for all I care. Um, Walk up music? I'd probably go like some old school biggie, like Juicy or something like that. I don't know. Or some, I don't know, maybe some red hot chili peppers. I don't know. I'd have to to think about that one a little bit. Probably probably be some hip hop, though, to get get the juices flowing. David's actually got some some members that he works with now that they said this week when they do their matches at the club, they actually play the uh, the Imperial March, the uh, Star Wars, oh, <laughs> as they come cool. up to the first tee. <laughs> and and you know now you know with people wearing masks and stuff, you know you can have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> That's funny. That's really. Funny. I, I I'm That's gonna have great. Fred on the show to confirm this walk up music stuff now too. Mm. For sure. One, once you get this done, you'll have to send it to me so I can show Fred that I called him out publicly. <laughs> right. <laughs> this will be public, believe me. Awesome. So Mark Leishman decides to partner with Cam Smith. And Mark Leishman's a fairly clean-cut guy. He might have a little scruff going here and there. But you know, Cam Smith is fully committed to this mullet right now. And okay. he's got the, 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 the nasty stash going in the mullet. And he said to his girlfriend that he would cut it if he won. And so they start off the week as partners, and Leishman goes out on Saturday, shows up with like a full, huge mullet wig just to mock That's Cam good. Smith. And then the song he picked for the team was something about running your hand your hands through my mullet. And the announcers couldn't even say the name of it. They were laughing so hard. So it's pretty pretty fun to see some of these guys that are normally fairly, you know, quiet to kind of show some of their personality uh with through this event. And uh so like I said, the format kind of switched, two-man best ball, alternate shot, two-man best ball, alternate shot, kind of a fun way to do it. And actually, Joel Beal from Golf Digest tweeted that he'd love to see him switch to Sunday where it's a scr- – or on Saturday, either way, and do uh, like a, a scramble on Saturday uh, just to see how low they could go in a two-man scramble. Yeah. And then yeah. on Sunday, like a, a worse ball. Mm-hmm. So, you know, take the worst shot each time. Yeah. Or the you know you could do worse shot scramble style, or you could do you know worse score on each hole and, rather than the best ball. So like kind it. of a fun. Uh, I like it, but I like that the tour is trying to be creative and doing some different things. Uh, so should should we should. have big cups too? <laughs> well, <laughs> two two man scramble big cups, and they and, and they, they all ride carts. 
and they all get to play music on their cart. <laughs> they all get to wear jorts. I mean, where do we draw the line, right? I mean, this could this could get pretty fun. Uh, so, so by by the way, though, as this show goes forward, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna walk off my uh, my picks for the week because I'm uh, as we know I'm terrible at them. And Aiden picked Leishman this week. Nice way to go, Aiden. So I also had uh, Leishman this week because I got to pay the price of Mark Leishman and get Cam Smith for free. So I thought that was a good value because Cam <laughs> Smith is hot right now. Uh, so, so some really interesting stuff when we're talking about the alternate shot. Patrick Cantlay and Xander Shoffley shot five under on Sunday in the alternate shot. And they were kind of middle of the pack. Cameron Percy and Greg Chalmers were also kind of middle of the pack going into Sunday. And they shot 82. So could you imagine being a, a two-man team on tour and shooting 10 over it, with fans? You know, because they had fans now and no masks. So I, I'm guessing they probably heard about it a little bit. That's, uh, <laughs> That's um, But it just goes to show you how impressive it is that these other guys are shooting, you know, five, six, yeah. seven under on uh, alternate shot rounds. It's very, very tricky. Mm -hmm. So it came down the stretch, and you had Leishman and Cam Smith, so Team Australia, versus Charles Schwartzel and Louis Oosthuizen, Team uh, South Africa. And it kind of felt like it was like the Ryder Cup or the President's Cup for, for their situation because um, everyone else was kind of out of the event. And they were just going back and forth in alternate shot, and they ended up tying. And then they went back and played 18 again. As they're standing on 18 again, Louis Oosthuizen has the entire state of Louisiana to the left, and he puts it in the drink. And you could just see Schwartzel. They had actually interviewed Schwartzel earlier and said, like, you know, how long have you guys been friends? You're like, oh, you know, 20 years, junior golf, you know, we're close buddies. And like, you know, could anything that happened this week that make you guys not be friends anymore? Oh, no, no. And then first playoff hole is when Louis hits it in the middle of the lake. And it's like, you know, I know Louis is a pretty nice guy, but if I'm Schwartz, and then, and then it got worse. Like he hit one into the bunker and then he missed a putt. Like Louis just, you could tell Louis was just unfortunately doing what he's done a lot of his career which is take second place like he's never they came out and said he's never won on american soil now how crazy is that really like louis oosthuizen is that great of a player he you know his only big tournament he's won has been the british but that's not you know on american soil wow. so kind of crazy you know he lost that one masters to to bubba in the playoff and yep. um just a great player but he's never won anything over here which is just but when you watched him on 18 today, he's like, okay, well, kind of, it, it was hard to watch because you're just hoping he'd kind of pull it through. But, um, you know, that was not how it turned out. So a very fun course. What'd you think of the course, David? Because they did some different stuff with mowing the grass a couple different ways. Like they got rid of a lot of rough. Yeah, it was, it was shaved down for a while. Um, going back to what you just talked about, though, this reeks of every member guest shootout I've ever been involved with. It's... It's whatever hole you start on, 10th tee, first tee, and it's it's just, it's it's straight choking. It's it, mm -hmm. you, first person hits it into the water, and the next person's like, are, are you kidding me? What the yeah. what the F did you just do? I mean, mm -hmm. Blake, you've been a part of these. You know mm -hmm. what this is like. They're the best. It's awesome. <laughs> it's, it's... <laughs> so, so, Blake, one of the best storylines from the week, you've got Bubba Watson, who's 42, and Scotty Scheffler, who's 24. And Bubba Watson asks like eight or nine guys – to play with him and nobody said yes and then scotty said okay let me get back to you and then scotty goes and asks like three or four guys and nobody says yes to him he goes okay bubba i'll play with you and they actually you know they were in the hunt all the way through but it's just so funny like have you ever had that moment at the club where like someone asked you to play with them and you're like let me get back to you on that then you start going through the rolodex and like hey do you want to play do you want and then okay yeah i guess i'll play with you absolutely <laughs> I just, I'm just too blunt at this point. I just say no. It's not gonna work out. So, it's I mean, that's almost awesome. how it should be, though. At this point, yeah, you got to. It's, and so, how does it's... how does the format work? So, do you sign up for the event with a partner, or do a bunch of people get in or invited, then you get your partner? You whoever has status, whoever can play the event. Yeah. They go they go and pick their partner. So a lot of the international guys picked a partner, right? Like the Team Australia, Team mm -hmm. South Africa. Um, but it was kind of a little bit more awkward for some of the Americans. And I was thinking, like, Wyndham Clark and Taylor Gooch was another good story. So they were signed up for 2020 together. The event gets canceled. Mm -hmm. And then Wyndham Clark just assumed they were going to play together this year. So he shows up for a tour event 
earlier in the season and he's talking to Gooch and he's like, Yeah, you know, excited for the, the Zurich and there's like all of a sudden it's like actually uh i'm not gonna play with you i decided to play with max homa because last year got canceled and this year's a new year like <laughs> it's a lot of strain on a relationship right <laughs> that's funny so then yeah, sure. uh clark his he's caddies with van ruyen uh eric van ruyen's caddy alex goggert who actually uh played golf at the u and so did van ruyen so they decided to partner up and they actually had a pretty good week but I just, you know, these situations where it's like, you know, I thought we were going to always be partners and the other guy obviously didn't enjoy it as much or was thinking to go in a different direction or thought he could win with someone else. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it creates a lot of awkwardness. I guess it was kind of fun to see that like the PGA tour is just like us. Like it's yeah. the exact same deal, just a uh, more money involved and not pro shop credits. So, For sure. uh, yeah. so I've got, I've got yeah. a good buddy who, who's worked the Zurich classic a couple of times. And so I called him up today and I asked, like, hey, what do you got? What do you got on this event? And he was telling me stories about 2018 when we've talked about Kutcher on the show before with the, the whole caddy thing and what he paid. So in 2018, Kutcher played a money game on Wednesday, which is super common on tour. Wednesday is the money, the money game. And he took Daniel Berger for about 4K. Kucha asks for the money, and Berger says, "You'll get your money." Kuch pushes Berger up against a corner and throws fourteen hundred bucks at him and walks out. What? <laughs> like the, the the common rule on tour is when you play in a money game, you have to have the cash available that day at the end of that round to pay for it. It doesn't matter how much it is. Phil's talked about this publicly. Like he doesn't care if it's four grand, fifteen grand, thirty five grand. You have to have it available that day, and Burger doesn't who, have it. Who carries that amount of cash around, regardless this day and age? What's yeah. wrong with a wire? Yeah, yeah. What, where's Venmo at this point? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. You're supposed to just have a bunch of suitcases with you, in addition to the suitcases. Like... I remember one of, the, one of the greatest things when I was growing up, and I was a caddy at Was well, at a country club, and I'll, I'll refrain from the names again. Um, I watched a huge suitcase get opened and exchanged full of cash. I mean, obviously way before this, I'm, this is, I'm really young. Um, it's a lot of cash. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's explainable. There was no Venmo then. Correct. Like what, these guys, are, and these guys are playing for amounts that like, you're not just walking to the bank and taking out 200 grand cash to pay Matt Kuchar on Wednesday. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe that's how these guys keep their clubs from getting damaged when they travel. They just fill their travel bag up, all the spots around their driver and stuff with cash, you know, just big Must cash be. rolls and <laughs> keep be. it nice and fluffy in there. I, That's a whole nother level. Uh, <laughs> a little different than the $10 uh, NASA on Saturday morning, huh, Blake? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, D different than my 555. <laughs> so, I'm not, not getting out of bed for 555. <laughs> So, so the other one that caught me off guard, though, by him was, and I've met Bryson before, and we've talked about Bryson on the show, whether he's good for golf or not, um, which we've all agreed he is just for various things. But Bryson, again, in 2018, on 18, so tour vans at tour events have to leave Wednesday. They cannot, they're not allowed to be there for the tournament. So Bryson gets done with his, his uh, practice run on Wednesday and goes back to the the practice facility and is hitting ball after ball swearing and yelling at his caddy he goes back and forth to the tour van for cobra puma he hits one ball goes back to the tour van one ball goes back to the tour fan he's trying to figure out the lie angle of his clubs for down grain versus in grain lies in bermuda grass and his caddy finally took the bag sat down on it on his cell phone for an hour because he couldn't take it. I'm, I'm assuming this is similar to how you act before your rounds as well, Blake, right? Like you, you're probably, probably got it really dialed in on all your clubs. Picture DeChambeau, then the exact opposite. <laughs> I'll show up an hour early. I'll spend 45 minutes at the bar. I'll never actually get to the range. <laughs> I'll grab a scorecard. I won't even stretch, and we go right to the first tee. That's my warm-up. I mean, in all fairness, forty-five minutes at the bar is is stretching. So, that's if, if I don't do that, then I'm gonna three putt everything. 
If I drink for like 30 minutes, I'm down to a two putt. 45, I can start one putting. <laughs> <laughs> day in, day in, day in. Otherwise, I can like slide. I, everything's right in the yip zone if I don't have a couple drinks. You know, that's that's hilarious because the uh, Golf Digest actually did a report this week. Uh, obviously, this last week uh, included the day April twentieth, also known as four twenty, and they yep. did a full review on what marijuana does in the system for playing golf, and then try to compare it against alcohol. And essentially, everything that they said was moderation. You know, and everybody has kind of their their comfort spots. So it was interesting because they said basically that you know overdoing it just like with you know with alcohol is going to create a a bad impact but for a lot of people it, it definitely helps and obviously the yeah. cbds and some of those types of things really are helping a lot of guys as well so yeah. it's uh there's a lot of different ways to to get the job done right so yeah so brad i'll be honest i did not see the most recent article that did this but i know they did this in the past was this a different study that they did it just popped up this week from golf digest so i'm not sure if it was a brand new one or something that they brought out of the the vault, but because they did it, say moderation was good, which I thought the, was the interesting. One that, yeah, the one they did before had like, if you had one to three drinks, you were way more accurate than you were being sober. But if you had three to six drinks, it was like 40 feet worse at 100 yards. And I think that that's, that's the hard part, right? Just with anything is like getting kind of that sweet spot. If you're doing any of those, you know, and because it just like with Advil, ibuprofen, anything like if you take a bit before the round, obviously wears off at a certain point, right? Mm -hmm. And so, just trying to, you know, I, I guess that we could just, you know, hit balls every day and maybe stretch and do all those things, but <laughs> there's uh, there's there's other things that sometimes need to be done to, to help you get to where you need to go. So, I should just bring a breathalyzer with me. <laughs> get, get you to 0.06, kind of that sweet yeah. spot. I have a sober handicap and then like a 0.04 to 0.1 handicap. It goes down once I get to that 0.5 range. So I have two separate handicaps. The USGA counts one and then the local <laughs> bar scene has a totally different one that I go off of. That's hilarious. <laughs> the uh, So there's some really interesting, <laughs> getting back to the golf, there's some really interesting shots this week. I saw, when, speaking of Wyndham Clark, shot saw him on one hole take his shoes off, roll his pants up, wearing a white shirt and go into the pond. And you could tell right as he's about to hit the shot that he kind of had that like, oh, we're in Louisiana and there's like snakes and alligators in here. And he hit it so fast and he almost made it. Went right over the hole, had like a 15 footer left for birdie. But you could kind of see he's having that moment. And when they asked him afterwards, he goes 100%. He goes, I was so scared yeah. about that. And, uh, you know, it, it seems like, you know, there's those situations out there that you just inevitable that they're going to happen. I, I probably saw 10, 15 guys this week have to take shoes off or something and be down in the water. And I don't know, my personal opinion is like, if I'm down in the Southern part of the country and I'm near the water, I'm just going to, just going to call it a day, take the penalty yeah. stroke and move on. Yeah. Take wasn't it, it, it's not worth wasn't it. Wasn't it Clark that hit one 10 feet from a gator? Yeah. So, so here's my question. How, what's, what's the range you have to be away from an alligator to hit a shot? Well, if I can see it, I'm not hitting it. <laughs> Blake, are you right-handed? I am. So for me, like if I'm right-handed and if it's in front of me, I could probably go with like 20 yards, right? But if it's, you know, if it's in front of me and 20 yards away, cause then I could still see if it's coming my direction. But like if it's within fifty yards and it's behind me, I'm probably just gonna move to the next hole. Cause like, well, even if it's in front of you, what do you think you're gonna do about it when it starts to go after you? You're gonna see your death instead of <laughs> not see your death. That's a good like, point. <laughs> I, guess, I guess there's a reason why I stay in Minnesota, Blake. <laughs> yeah. you, a walleye is not gonna end your life. <laughs> Those yeah, geese, going to. I've had a few geese hiss at me, but nothing uh, nothing like seeing the, the alligator come right at me. That's a good point. Just because you can see it doesn't mean you're going to be able to stop it. Dude, I, thought I, I, I don't know if I, don't know if I can do it. Golf, but if, I, if, I can, if I can I was, see uh, it. In, in South Africa a few years back, and we were in these canoes, these metal canoes, and we ran into like hippopotamuses that were... 20 yards away and they would go under the water and you wouldn't be able to see when they would pop back up. And when they opened their mouths, 
I was legitimately the most scared I've ever been in my whole life. I thought I was, he would have just chewed right through the metal canoe and we would have been done. I was scared shitless. Any of those types of animals, <laughs> it's a wrap. I'm out of there. <laughs> That's well, probably they, a good way to <laughs> good way to handle it. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're all basically like they're modern day dinosaurs. Right. I, I'm out. Yeah. And the, if I got to shoot a 81 seven eighty versus getting my leg gnawed off like Chubbs and Happy Gilmore, I'm out of there. <laughs> it's not. It's just not worth it. And alligator bit my hand off. Me. I'm gonna miss the putt anyway, so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we, we started down this rabbit hole by talking about Wyndham Clark, and Wyndham Clark is actually a PXG guy, and just reminded me of our friends at PXG. So Parsons Extreme Golf, uh, founded and run by Bob Parsons, who founded GoDaddy originally, and uh, now decided he wanted to get into the golf business. So they make some great golf clubs. They're currently in the process of selling their Gen 4s right now. They give you a very unique fitting experience. So if you're at all interested in new golf clubs this season, please call, please call the PXG store in Southdale today. Uh, make an appointment to get fit because they are very, very booked right now. So go check out the new Gen 4s and see why Wyndham Clark and others uh, love these sticks. If you don't have an appointment and you're just in the Southdale area, feel free to stop in and check out their products. They've got a really nice putting green in there. And uh, you know nobody makes clubs the way they do. So feel free to check out PXG in Southdale today. The uh, Saturday on hole 18, I'm watching this thing and I just couldn't stop watching this. Cam Champ gets up there. And Cam Champ and Tony Finau have the lead at this point. Cam Champ puts it right in the water, and then to, and they're playing best ball. Tony smokes it down the middle, but you could tell, obviously, he's a bit nervous. Blake, have you ever played in a partner event like that where the guy you're playing with totally leaves you hanging? I mean, it wasn't as bad as what we saw today at the end of the playoff when alternate shot in the water, like, obviously worse. But if you're playing two-man best ball and you've got a partner, have you ever experienced that where someone just left you hanging, and how did you handle it? It happened last year at our... Our course, Oak Ridge, just opened the end of last year. My partner, Brett, helped me, left me out to dry at least six times in a row. And like true <laughs> champions, I had them out every time. <laughs> had to, had to uh, we had a chip off, had to get closest to keep it moving, had to drain like a 15-footer and pitch black and probably blacked out just to keep the thing going. <laughs> just kept bailing them out like a bail bondsman. <laughs> Thanks, Holly. So did you guys win? We got second. Um, I mean, it was miraculous that we were even able to get to that point. But uh, I actually hit like a 15-footer. It was pitch black at this point. And hit a 15-footer to send it to another sudden death. And then the best player at Oak Ridge, who I think is like a plus two or plus three, hit like a 40-footer in the dark to win it. It was crazy. It was pitch black because we didn't do it till like October because our course didn't open till July or August. It was not the most well planned event from a timing standpoint, but we we're literally playing and it was, it was literally pitch black. Couldn't see a thing. Couldn't see in front of you. Everyone had their their phones out because you got the whole crowd of people following you. Everyone had their phones out just to make sure we could actually see the ball go in the hole. It was it was a lot of fun though. I, I love I love those events. I love these team events, and it's. But what, where's your sense of? Uh, and I'll ask this to both Blake, you and Brad. Where's your sense of nervousness when what you do affects the other person, and like you dump it in the water, and all of a sudden it's like, oh my god, look at the pressure I just put on this person. Because like a normal PJ Tour event, it's like the pressure you put on yourself is on yourself. Like I dump it in the water it's on me but now all of a sudden this is on someone else at the same time so like to me that's a huge added amount of pressure that's where the blood alcohol content level comes into play <laughs> <laughs> and it's at the end of the day it's a two-man event at your country club if that's pressure then you got a lot of issues yeah <laughs> right it'd be, it'd be so lot, it'd be a lot worse it's, it's funny you say that. There's two guys on tour this week that decided to play together that are both struggling quite a bit uh, the last probably five years. Guys that were both top 30 players, maybe top 10 players, Bill Haas and Hunter Mar uh, Mahan. And these guys decided to play together this week. 
and they're both playing really bad and it's not going well and they shot they shot three over for the two days and, and missed the cut by i think the cut was four or six or something under so not even close i just think about that like how hard is it when one guy's struggling and the other guy brings him down like colin morikawa has been playing really good golf lately and he played with matthew wolf this week who's been really struggling and they also shot three over this week like it just has to be so hard you know the positivity or the the blood alcohol level whatever it may be you know feeds off it with the other guy and if if one person's going south it's kind of hard not to go the same direction and uh one person that didn't get a partner this week was patrick reed and i was i was waiting to see who he was going to show up with and he didn't get a partner and it just i, I could see where that'd be a very interesting partner to play with because i don't do think he was he was signed up for the event and just couldn't find a partner no, he just didn't play, just but didn't play. but it's kind of interesting that, you know, he because he plays almost every event that's not, you know, it's not like Justin Thomas and some of those guys who play a, a more limited schedule, yeah. like he plays almost every event, but I was just, I would love to know like what the phone calls look like, like, hey, mm-hmm. top 15 player in the world, you sure you don't want to yeah. <laughs> click? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Brad, that's interesting. you should you should have called in and been like, I'll be your partner. <laughs> oh, gosh. You you and Patty Reed, pass. Um, <laughs> it's like anything else. You got to know. It's like any team sport, really. You got to know if you know what your partner can handle and what his confidence level is, and when they need to be loved up a little bit. It's like, you know, some guys are fragile. Some guys are just gamers. They show up on when the lights turn on. They're better, regardless of how they practice. There's other guys that are just perennial choke artists that need to be. You know, you got to know your audience. You got to know your partner. You got to know your team. Well, know what to say, what to do. Hunter needs to learn to chip. <laughs> that's the bottom line. No, and that's, I mean, we saw it with Tiger. You know, when Tiger had his issues, what was it, probably four years ago with chipping? I mean, it was painful for oh, a bit there. God, and you remember the Waste Management Open that one I was, year with him? I was there. It was very oh. sad. And and that's, you know, once these guys lose it, I think they kind of lose it mentally a bit too. You know, once it starts going one direction and they're just like us, you know, it takes a while to get it back. And speaking of Tiger, um, I don't know if you guys saw the pictures this week that surfaced of Tiger at his little golf course in his backyard uh, with his dog. Uh, he's on a crutch, but he's he's moving around. So that leads me to the next topic, Blake, right now. Tiger Woods, will he play another PGA Tour event? Will he play another PGA Tour event? I would say yes. And I have no idea what his actual injuries were, but I would say yes. I would just be surprised if that's the last you see of Tiger Woods. Like, he can't go out like that. David, do you think he'll win again? Yep. Do you think he'll win a major? Yep. I'm well, going 20. 20- I guess that means you think he'll play again. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, 22 Masters. It just seems like that's like the right timing for him to get. You know, maybe he'll play an event later this fall and then a couple of events next spring and kind of get things clicking. The crazy thing is that before his car accident, you know, he already had surgery right before that. So he's got a lot of things to, to mend. But I don't think he'd be, you know, posting pictures of himself moving around if he wasn't going in the right direction quickly. So I'm, I mean, we're pretty big Tiger Rubes on this show. So that's, but we, we know how good he is for the game. You know, it's, it's huge to have him out there. I, I think, I think he wins one more time. And I think it's the Masters. That's my Ooh. prediction. It's bold. So he doesn't beat Nicholas's record, but he wins one more time. Nope, I uh, I could see it. Speaking of Tiger, uh, I don't know if you saw it this week, Blake. The PGA Tour came out, and they've been fighting this uh, this Premier Golf League and some of this stuff that they've been discussing over in Europe, and they're trying to retain their guys. And they basically said this week they're going to spend forty million a year on the guys who bring the most ratings, if you will, to the tour. So eight players are going to get split a pot of 40 million. And obviously, you know, the guys that get the most are going to be paid the best, but it's ba- things like uh, how much you show up in a Google search, uh, how much you, uh, you know, fans are engaging with you on social media, stuff like that. Is Let me just think like, is the PJ tour in jeopardy of losing 
players to the European tour or whatever this new tour is in Europe? Is that like a real problem? It's it's a potential. It's I think they're just trying to box out. You know, they they know they're they're kind of still king right now, so they're trying to make sure they retain everyone. It's not a real problem though. I don't I don't think so, but it was kind of interesting and I wanted to get your take on it. Like like do you ever see the NFL doing something like this where, you know, they they try to or they start giving guys a little more love in addition to their contract or their endorsements? Or do you think it'll just always stay contract endorsements and no additional funding? I mean, I don't think the NFL will ever do that, at least not now, because they don't really have a problem, right? The revenue outside of COVID, the one year of COVID, you know, the revenues are skyrocketing. The new television deal is going to skyrocket and the popularity continues to increase. Um, and football is just so popular in this country that and it, it happens to be an all-American sport. You play high school football, you play college football, you're three years removed from high school and you can go to the NFL, that there is no competition. You have a farm system built in with the NCAA, um, so you don't even have to have a minor league system. <laughs> so I don't see it happening in the NFL. It could happen in other sports, um, but I don't know if I was – I don't follow golf that closely. I just play a lot. But I think golf has a problem because they don't – it's just not exciting to the young casual viewer. Um, so if they don't figure out a, a way to make it more enjoyable, um, it has nothing to do with how much more money you pay the top players in the world. That's not going to save the game. you got to figure out how do you get people like myself and 30-year-olds to go out to Blaine to watch the 3M Open. Figure that out first, not pay the top players in the world more money. That's not the problem. So my, my issue with this whole thing is if, if you're going to spend $40 million and you're going to make the top eight players basically richer, why are we not throwing some of this money at the younger players? Why are we not throwing this at the Corn Ferry Tour, the McKenzie Tour, the Canadian Tour, the Latino American Tour, the tours where you've got guys grinding with 144 person Monday qualifiers every single week? Like, let's try pumping that up. If you want to grow the game? Let's get yeah. these guys involved. Like, yeah, that, that yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, that, that, that's I mean, my issue with this whole thing. And and I work for the PJ Tour, so <laughs> it's it's a it's a great conversation. I mean, it, it, I get what they're trying to do, but you know, I like the smaller investment like this week of having walk up songs. <laughs> like that's mm -hmm. that's cooler. Like I wanted to hear what everyone's walk up song is and like you know learn a little bit about the guy. So, but I agree with you, Blake. There's there's something there that they're not gonna. They're still not competing with the the NFL, the NBA. Like it's just the excitement level isn't quite there, and that's why people like yourself, a very avid golfer, it's not really something you uh, you know you 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 can't miss on the weekends. Yeah, and the funny part is, and I don't know the numbers on this, but the PGA Tour is huge when it comes to revenues. So it's not like they have um, money and budget issues. They can they they have money to go around, and so I understand they can throw forty million at this. It it can go elsewhere and be better, in my opinion. It's a you know, and it's a it's a traditionalist sport, right? So yep. it's hard to, at least for the the historians and the people that built it it's and the people that are in charge it's hard for them to make any real changes because it's a it is the classical you know traditionalist sport so what do you really do without tinkering you know with the game which ultimately you got to make a decision either you kind of got to you know you, you got to make changes or you're going to die at some point you know like baseball they're going through it like i don't know how i don't know what baseball is going to look like in 30 years like no young people are going to baseball games anymore they're boring as hell. Like I get through three innings. I'm like, why did I come here again? Every year I give it a shot. Like maybe it's better. Like, no, it's the same. It's horrible. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, and like a lot of these teams aren't making money. So they're going to have to do something. They're going to have to get creative and either shorten seasons or I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. They put the mound back and like the, the traditionalists are going to have to get out of the way. Otherwise the game is just going to die eventually. Like, you know, you could be as stubborn as you want if you're fine with the thing dying. It's going to die eventually. Right. <laughs> or you can change. <laughs> One of the traditions that the tour does that I really like is for the PGA Championship. So that's the next major coming up in May. Um, they have a national club pro tournament that's a, a few weeks before it. 
and whoever qualifies at that, the top 20 guys get to play on tour. So it's kind of a cool way to get, you know, an opportunity to guys that are, you know, like David, that are, you know, professionals at regular clubs, mm -hmm. try to give them a chance. And no, David did not qualify for nationals this year, yeah, that's, but that's uh, <laughs> nationals did start today, actually, in Port St. Lucie. We had eight Minnesotans in the event. And after the first round, we actually had uh, two guys, Chris Croach from Rose Creek in Fargo and Jeff Sorensen in Minicata, both shot even. So mm -hmm. they're in the top 30 right now. So they have a chance to make it through. And actually, our friend Derek uh, Holmes, who's the store manager for PXG in Southdale, uh, he shot one over. So wow. kind of cool to see some of the local cool. guys uh, doing well. And uh, Luke Benoit, who founded the Ripstick, and the CEO of Ripstick, he actually made it as well. Uh, he was two under after four, I think, and then it went a little different direction after that. But it's cool to see him on the leaderboard, and obviously with everything he's doing with not only teaching lessons but with the Ripstick, uh, pretty cool to see those guys, you know, doing like we talked about earlier, you know, multiple careers, right? Like here's mm -hmm. my day job and here's my yeah. my night job, and it's cool to see those guys have a chance to get to play on tour. For sure, that is cool. That is cool. Um, so Blake, one of the things that Brandy and I started at the as we came back from kind of our pandemic pause was every week we want to talk about one local business or multiple local businesses that we supported that week uh, because we obviously you've seen plenty of it where you know the local businesses just like you obviously you're very local business um, you know people th things have struggled so. Mm -hmm. We always talk about like what's the local business you supported this week, and I'll kick it off. Uh, on Tuesday, we went to Sweet Basil, a little place in Brooklyn Park. Got uh, some sesame chicken, and my wife got pad thai. And then on Thursday, there's this place in St. Louis Park called uh, Muddy Paws Cheesecake. Mm -hmm. It's right by a park tavern, mm -hmm. and they have every Thursday night all summer long or all year long they are having uh, live music and a food truck. So we, they had the Bad Rooster food truck was there, which was kind of cool. Really good chicken tenders, chicken sandwiches, and waffle fries. Um, and then some cheesecake as well in the parking lot, live music. It's kind of a cool deal. And uh, we just love supporting those those local yeah, people sure. that are you know grinding to make it through. What uh, Anywhere you guys go recently that's uh, local? We went to, there's a, a place called Kai Sushi on uh, 101 in Minnetonka Boulevard, which we love. Uh, it's a little kind of hole in the wall sushi place, which we think is great. So we went there. Um, we got Thumbs Cookies, which um, a really close friend of ours owns. Uh, it's awesome. They're these little, little thumb sized cookies, but they're great. So whenever we have a chance to get them, we can, and we always send them to clients and whatnot. And my wife is a jewelry designer who owns a business called Gold Fine Jewelry. So I try to support her as much as possible as well. <laughs> nice. I, I like it. Good stuff. Yeah. How about you, Branny? Besides uh, all of the local uh, fourth, fifth, sixth grade uh, football stuff we had going, what uh, what else did you do locally? Dude, I was outside today for three youth football games. This oh, awesome to watch, but man, I'm still I'm still fine. Wind chill of 32, 33? Yeah, at least it didn't, it didn't rain, it didn't snow, so that was good. But <clears throat> what football is being played right now? So we got NFL flag football for both my kids. Okay. And then seven on seven uh, football league as well. Oh, which seven on seven do they play? Maple Grove. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So it, it's a blast. It's a lot of fun. And this year for my six-year-old Liam, it's his first year of really playing, playing games. And for my 10-year-old, like NFL flag football is like legit. They're actually like real plays. That's awesome. They're actually throwing. It's, it's a blast, but... Dang it, today was cold. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for local businesses, other than a uh, flag football and seven on seven, last week we did Sweet Taste of Italy uh, in Brooklyn Park. I revisited uh, Johnny Boy's Pizza because I, I freaking love that place. Where is that? And then Johnny Boy's is right in Brooklyn Park off of 85th and is that Zane, Brad? It's, it's, or, yeah, or it's it's pretty close Broadway. to almost over to all the way to 169, like by the Brooklyn Park Golf Dome or mm -hmm. uh, the Fleet Farm there. So yeah. it's a good spot. It's actually one of our neighbors that owns it, and uh, they do it. It's it's just different, 
and that's one thing we always talk about like there's so many different places out there that you don't know about if no one mm-hmm. talks about them so we're yeah. going to try to pump out all the the local businesses my sister opened a restaurant during the pandemic in andover and i talk about it every week so we don't need to talk about this week but <laughs> we went there again for brunch and uh it's how just many, how many days a week do you go there we usually go once a week we usually go once or twice a week what's uh, the name of it it's called margie's okay and it's in Andover, and my sister and her husband, the kids, uh, started it last year. And it's uh, you, the food's pretty awesome. The drinks are great. It's a uh, Andover doesn't have a lot of places like that. They had a lot of chains mm-hmm. or bar barn restaurants, so it's a little bit more upscale than what was available. And the community has really supported it. So it's kind of awesome. like I said to us. It's just you know David and I. Obviously, a lot of our business that we do, both of us, is all relationships. So we're just trying mm-hmm. to get the words out there about everybody and you know now we have uh someone in the uh in the sports agency business so if anyone's looking for uh an agent we got anyone listening that's uh maybe making a a run at the tours uh or you know blake can help you with with some of that or if you got someone listening that's uh gonna maybe be in the upcoming draft for the nfl uh you could help out so yeah it's uh, i'm gonna get a a thousand intern applicants is what i'm gonna get out of it Hey, that's okay. We all need interns, right? I'm just kidding. That's oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's really cool what you're doing, and I think it's awesome to have someone that you know is from here, uh, moved around, learned the business, and then come back here. Uh, we really, you know, that's just cool that you're doing that in Minnesota because you could have done something like this in a variety of other states. So thanks for bringing that business back to our state, and thanks for selecting so many of our gophers to be a, a part of your crew. That's pretty cool. So no, we hope no you guys. We yeah. hope you guys have a big week uh, this week. We'll be waiting, and uh, I'm sure your phone will be blowing up. And uh, <laughs> we really appreciate you being on the show. It was uh, really fun to hear what you do, and uh, again, a whole different spin on things. And we love hearing about your uh, your partner situations at the different <laughs> member events. <laughs> no, thanks for having me. We'll have to we'll have to continue the dialogue out on out on the golf course. Awesome. awesome, awesome. Thanks, Blake. We really appreciate it. We thanks appreciate it. Also, I uh, want to thank our sponsors, Jarrett Yalen with Northwestern Mutual and PXG. Uh, you can connect with us, as always, via email at 10kswings at scorenorth.com. And please subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Score North, and give us a five-star rating. For next week, we'll have Ty Munichie with PXG to break down the Valspar and teach us all about some club feeding. Until next week, friends, I'm Brad Cole. I'm David Branstead. Cheers. <laughs>